Okay. Looks like Dennis is okay. So the other thing meeting, which is March 17th, we're gonna have Jennifer McClung, who's the exhibits manager for the Las Cruces Museum, Museums. And she will be discussing aviation in Southern New Mexico, uh, which was part of her discoveries from curating the exhibit cleared for takeoff aviation in Southern New Mexico, which is currently on display at the Brannigan Cultural Center. And now let me introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Jerry Wallace uh, is a history professor at NMSU. His research interests include urban architecture and neighborhood identities in the American Sun Belt and Borderlands. In, in 2019, he wrote an article for the New Mexico Historical Review, All Over New Mexico, the Bellama Edition and Borderland Neighborhoods in the Early Cold War Era. And that's gonna be his topic tonight. So with that, I'll introduce Jerry Wallace. We're not in the slideshow. Okay, let me share it here. Is that sharing? Yes. Okay. Okay, okay Jerry. Let me see if I can. All right, so this is gonna be a challenge for me because as some of my students that are in the audience know, I'm a roamer when I lecture, when I talk and I'm not gonna be able to do that. So I'm gonna probably get a little antsy and I'm I might leave. So I'm just, you know, uh, kind of warning you up uh, ahead of time. So what I brought, so before I get into the talk tonight of looking at Del Bellama and uh, Bellama neighborhoods and Las Cruces and throughout the state as the uh, presentation of the title says all over New Mexico, I just wanna let you know for those of you that are here, uh, this, this was published in the fall 2019 uh, New Mexico Historical Review. Uh, the review was very kind to give me tons of extra copies um, at this point. Um, my mom has gotten enough of these. So I brought a few of the tearaways if anybody wants to read something a little bit more in depth about what I'm presenting tonight. I'm really only gonna be able to give you a snapshot of the actual presentation and really only a snapshot of really looking at Del Bellama and these neighborhoods uh, throughout the state. So um, uh, if you would like one of those, you know, just please come and get one afterwards or you can, uh, you can email me as well. So, okay. So uh, I thought before I would actually get into looking at this particular topic, um, I would just share a little bit of, a, of how I kind of, how this, how this particular, um, how this particular story kind of dropped in my lap. Uh, because sometimes uh, when you're a historian, you know, you have a story about the story that you're telling. And so I thought I would just kind of share that uh, with you. So when I was at UNM uh, as a grad student, I was actually working on a dissertation that was looking at the relationships between animals and people living in New Mexico throughout the 20th century. I was particularly interested in why we thought that bears could be firefighters. I was very interested in why uh, we love to put coyotes on our fireplace, but then kill them in nature. I was really interested in like our relationship with deer and so I was working actively on, on writing a dissertation about that. In fact, I was about three chapters in when some of the animals that I was writing about weren't playing fair. And what I mean by that is that they were migrating into cities and I couldn't talk about cities because I was used to the animals being out in nature. So I went over to the architecture department at UNM and I started talking to people because I needed to be able to have the vocabulary you know, the vernacular to be able to talk about city landscapes because I didn't know how to talk about them. One person I spoke to was, at the time I had no idea who he was, so it's kind of embarrassing to say, but well, the first person I spoke to was Chris Wilson, a very prominent New Mexico historian. He wrote a, an awesome book, if you haven't read it, it's called The Myth of Santa Fe. So I started asking him these questions, you know, picking his brain on how I could get this information I needed to talk about cityscapes. And he basically said, hey, why don't you take my class um, and I can teach you everything you need to know. And in my mind, I was like, well, I don't need to take classes anymore. <laughs> I just need to finish my dissertation. But I ended up taking his class 
And it was a methods class on historic preservation and it actually completely changed my entire um, career path because I kind of didn't really abandon that. I, I abandoned the other dissertation, never abandoning the ideas because I'm currently working on some of them, but I, I actually wrote a completely different dissertation and I, uh, my dissertation really looks at neighborhood identities in the borderlands uh, in the 20th century. And so I, the, my, the other chapters of my dissertation look at Henry Trost, um, Clifford May or Cliff May in California and Del Webb, uh, the founder of Sun City in Phoenix. But the highlight of my entire dissertation is Del Belma. And uh, this was the first chapter I wrote uh, because of my experience in Chris Wilson's class. And also um, it was the first thing to get published. Uh, it was actually published before I finished the, the, the dissertation. And so um, that's what I wanted to come and share you, with you today. And so um, I'm gonna flip to the next slide here. And so I, I created these slides. So I just wanna be upfront about this as well. Um, the, the there's 70 slides here, but don't feel intimidated by that because a lot of them are just visual so that you can kind of, it, it kind of eliminates what I'm talking about. For some reason though, when I hit the button here, it doesn't go forward. All right, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so I thought I would start off by sharing with you what the argument of uh, my general idea about looking at Del Bellum. But before I do that, I wanna kind of just give us the backdrop of kind of what's going on nationally in the country in the late 1940s and the 1950s. And where this particular topic, where Del Bellum kind of comes into the national narrative is that um, what we see that that is a product of the uh, of the United States in the late 1940s is that the government is essentially subsidizing home ownership in this country. And a cooler way of saying that is that the government is very invested in making Americans homeowners. And there's a, several initiatives that that the federal government rolls out that um, that really sort of illuminates this uh, investment in American home ownership. One, the Federal Housing Administration creates or, or really sort of backs the 30 year home mortgage, which makes buying a house now affordable for lots of Americans, not just some. And the other initiative is making interest rates on home mortgages tax deductible. And so all of a sudden now home ownership becomes very viable to millions and millions of Americans. Um, whereas before the Second World War, home ownership was not very accessible for many Americans. Only, only a certain percentage, very low percentage of Americans could actually uh, buy homes. And so because of these government sort of sponsored kind of programs or back programs, and all of that all of a sudden makes home ownership very uh, successful. So I wanted to kind of share that so that it kind of, it, it, what I wanted to kind of show here is that Las Cruces, New Mexico, the borderlands are um, the backdrop to kind of understanding home ownership in this area really falls in line with the national conversation, the, the, nas the national experience of home ownership. And sort of a sub argument of that national home ownership during this, this, this time is that it really represents presents patriotism and conformity in, the, in, in this sort of contest of values that the United States has uh, with the Soviet Union. So that's the backdrop of kind of understanding Del Bellama and his neighborhoods uh, in New Mexico. So I created a, a little bit of a list here of some of the arguments. And so I'm just gonna kind of rattle them off so that we can kind of understand it. When I was at UNM, I was a graduate assistant for a New Mexico history class and <laughs> One of the interesting things about that experience was that I never, I, I, we never talked about anything south of Berlin. It's almost as if like nothing existed below that. And so um, when I started, when I started looking at this particular story, I felt that this was a, a way, a gateway for uh, Las Cruces to become part of the narrative. And in fact, I make a very strong argument in this article and in my dissertation that um, Las Cruces actually plays a key role in looking at home 
home ownership and understanding home ownership in New Mexico uh, during the 1940s, 50s, uh, and, the six, and the 60s. Del Bellamy, um, he also was very instrumental in proving that mass-produced homes and neighborhood designs could, be could, could work in smaller cities like Las Cruces. As we will see, um, Las Cruces was a very small community at the end of the war, um, uh, and within a 10-year period, it almost triples in population size. And so uh, we'll look at those numbers uh, in just a moment. Um, another thing that I, 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 that is one of the underlying themes in my, um, in my dissertation or in the, in the article, if you were to read it, and what I'll show you today is that what becomes super fascinating about Del Bellama and uh, the neighborhoods is that the neighborhoods are mobile. The neighborhoods are on the move. I know that sounds like a really weird thing to say, right? Because neighborhoods are fixed, and yet Del Bellama recreates the same neighborhood in lots of smaller New Mexico cities, in smaller cityscapes in West Texas and Southern Colorado. So that leads to the next thing is that most New Mexicans that lived in these smaller cityscapes had a sh same shared lived experience because they lived in these neighborhoods. So it didn't matter if you were living in a Del Bellama neighborhood in Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Hobbs, Roswell, Alamogordo, you essentially lived in the same neighborhood because he reproduced the same subdivision plat in each one of these cities. So when you go into these communities, you, it's almost like if you go into any McDonald's today, you could go into one in Indiana, California, New Mexico, you're going into essentially the same space. So it's a, it's a very fascinating thing because we don't see a lot of developers. In fact, I've yet to come across one that had as much of an impact on the cultural landscape and on the built landscape that Belma is gonna have in Mexico for about a 30 year period. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to really uh, illuminate, especially not only tonight, but I illuminated in, in the article that I wrote, was that oftentimes when Bellama is mentioned in New Mexico, his story has been reduced to understanding urban development in Albuquerque. But if we really want to understand his impact and really want to understand how he shaped a very shared living experience in New Mexico, we have to look at all of his subdivisions across New Mexico. Most of his, uh, uh, most of his promotional materials had this, um, had this mantra all over New Mexico. He lived up to that particular mantra by building nearly 15,000 homes over the course of his life uh, in New Mexico. Well, this is Del Bellama. Um, he looks like what you would probably see as a very typical American <laughs> male in the 1950s, you know, and so it kind of play, he plays himself into that idea of conformity um, in, in the 1950s. So uh, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about who Bellamo uh, was. He was born in 1914 uh, in Socorro, New Mexico. His uh, father was Lebanese, so he spoke Arabic with his father, and his mother was Mexican-American, so he spoke Spanish with his mother. And it wasn't until he moved to Albuquerque in his early teens that he actually started learning English. So he's a super fascinating character in the fact that he has these, this different sort of ethnic experience uh, in New Mexico. So he often would talk, you know, state in interviews that English was the third language that he spoke um, uh, as a child and as an early teen. So super fascinating guy in that aspect. When his family moves to Albuquerque, they moved to the Borellis uh, neighborhood. If you're not familiar with it, that's the neighborhood that's pretty close to the rail yards. Uh, it's typically a very working class uh, Mexican-American uh, community. And so that was his lived experience there. He never referred to himself as poor, but it, I, you get the sense that, that, that he definitely came from a family didn't, that didn't have a lot of means. And so that really shaped his, uh, his sort of his experience as well. Uh, he goes to college at UNM, uh, and uh, he, while he's in college, he opens up a liquor store uh, in, uh, off of Girard in Central, if I can remember off the top of my head, uh, and that's the way that he puts himself through college. However, during, and in, in 1943, he will enlist in the Army and, and serve for two years. When he comes back 
to Albuquerque after the war, he sells his family liquor store and he uses that money to build three houses near Kirkland Air Force Base. With the money that he makes from that, he rolls it over and within two years, he builds more than 100 homes uh, in the Albuquerque um, sort of built uh, environment, the built fabric. He builds them in different neighborhoods. Um, and because of the success, and we're gonna see why he's successful in just a moment, uh, because of the success, he then is able to uh, bankroll a lot of investment and he starts to um, develop communities in, Albu in Albuquerque. And because of his ability to build affordable, cheap homes in Albuquerque, we see that the city of Las Cruces in 1952 is going to commission him to try to build neighborhoods in this community. And we'll take a look at that in just a moment. So um, his claim to fame in Albuquerque is Princess Jen, uh, Janine Park, although I always say Princess Jenny because that's the way I've always known it. But in Albuquerque, I'm sort of corrected by that. So I'm going to probably say Jenny, you know, and so I just wanted to be you know, open about that. Um, he, I'm, I'm going to come back to some of this Princess Jenny stuff in just a little bit, but I just wanted to show you some of the promotional materials here. Okay, uh, what I thought about, I would talk about next is a kind of understanding Bellama's um, company organization. It's actually very fascinating. He uh, creates, his company is actually organized under one large company called um, the Bellama, sorry, I can't, let's see, uh, Bellama Enterprises. And underneath that, he has 16 subsidiary companies. And so I have those in a footnote um, in the article. You can kind of take a look at it, but it's super fascinating. Some of the subsidiary companies are like Bellama Realty, Bellama Subdividers, Bellama Housing, um, Bellama Property Rentals. And so the way that I the way that I sort of categorize this is that he becomes a one-stop shop place for um, Americans and New Mexicans looking to buy a house. I don't have to go to all of these different places. They can go to the company. Um, they can go to the, the essentially the the, um, the company office, the Bellma company office, and be able to buy a house on the spot, much like what you would be able to do for buying a car today. You can go to a car dealership, find a car that you like. You go into the office. They find a loan for you and you're ready to go. And so he sort of creates this, and this is very, very cutting edge at the time um, that he starts building houses in New Mexico in the early 1950s. Because he is a veteran, because he is from a lower class neighborhood, low, uh, sort of a working class neighborhood in New Mexico, he really marketed to those particular demographics. And he's all about touting how he will work with uh, veterans. So uh, in, in a lot of the uh, promotional material, you'll see him targeting uh, those particular two groups. He's also very fascinating in some of the rules that he has when he starts to build neighborhoods. All of his company's em employees have to live in the neighborhood. So he even himself lives, has a house in every neighborhood uh, in the state. So he kind of bounces around and so, so do all the company uh, employees. Uh, and one of the more fascinating things that he creates is something known as the Architect Control Committee, which basically is this uh, in-house group that looks at potential projects uh, and whether it might be like building a massive new subdivision or contributing to one that's already established. Uh, the, he refers to the people that work in the Architect Control Committee as the brain trust, and he hires a lot of recently graduate uh, graduated UNM students from the architecture program. So he, he's about, he, he touts himself as being more about a person that is providing jobs for New Mexicans. Um, um, so it's, it's, it, it, the company organization of that is very fascinating. Um, so that we can kind of understand his neighborhoods, I thought I'd just give you a really quick rundown of Las Cruces history um, at this time. And it's, it's fair to say that Bellowa, when he starts building homes in Las Cruces, he happens to be at the right place at the right time. If you kind of look at these numbers right here, um, Las Cruces population, can I move this window? Yeah. I can move this to the side, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
apologize for uh, everybody on Zoom that sees this. Oh, that works. Yeah. Okay. Can we go back here too? There we go. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So if you, you can see on the slide right here in 1952, when Bellama is commissioned by the city of Las Cruces to um, start building uh, homes in, in the community, Las Cruces' population uh, is about 12,000. But within eight years, uh, Las Cruces' population is going to almost triple. Uh, it will be 32,000. And within the, the county itself, it's going to be close to 60,000. So he, 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 he's more than in the right place at the right time. He, because of the, his ability to build these sort of cheap vernacular style homes in Albuquerque and the city partnering with him, he's able to meet a huge demand of new New Mexicans moving to um, Las Cruces. And really it's transplant people that will become New Mexicans uh, through this process. Uh, what's attracting people to this area? Well, there's two large things. One is going to be New Mexico State. Uh, at the end of the war, the population of New Mexico State University, which is New Mexico A&M at the time, is roughly 500 students. And by 1970, there will be anywhere from two to 3,000 students uh, at NMSU. And so that's one attraction to the community. But really, the biggest is going to be uh, the, the missile range uh, out on the east part of uh, Doniana County. And so that's gonna, that is gonna bring a lot of people to Doniana County, to Las Cruces, and those, uh, and those individuals need homes. So um, I wanted to sort of kind of also talk about Las Cruces' landscape. When Bellama starts building here in 1952, Las Cruces is actually raci racially segregated. It's not until the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision in 1954 that Las Cruces desegregates. And so technically when Bellama starts building his first uh, neighborhood, uh, he, he has to follow these racial ordinance and codes, but he doesn't. He actually builds homes for people, um, for working class uh, um, uh, New Mexicans. So he kind of ignores those racial uh, codes that are, that are in place. When he comes to Las Cruces, there's really only two neighborhoods in the city. The, the, the neighbor, one of the neighborhoods is Alameda, which you can see on some of these slides. Um, these would be more affluent homes that are on the west side of Main Street. This home right here is the Hoyt home built by Henry Trost, the architect from El Paso. Um, this is a craftsman or a bungalow, California bungalow home. Um, this is right near the railroad depot. So this would be a, a very popular architectural style coming out of California. This is a colonial style home that's actually just a couple of houses over um, uh, right near the, the railroad depot. This is another craftsman home. This is uh, on Alameda. This is another colonial style home. Um, this was Senator Papin's home. Uh, so this is right down the street from the railroad depot as well. Um, and then on the other side of Main Street, the east side is the Mesquite neighborhood, um, which um, a historian by the name of Daniel Ariola has, ha, has labeled this neighborhood a Mexican streetscape. Um, what that means is that these homes are on smaller lots. They're built up right to the public right of way. Usually the original homeowner built the home. So let me point out a couple of those things. So if you take a look, here uh, at this home, uh, you can see that the, the house is built right up to the public right away, whereas in these other homes, there's a usually a huge sort of cushion between the public right away and the entry of the home. So these are built right up to the right up to the sidewalk with a very small little fence that separates the public right away from the home. You can see just looking at this home. The, probably the front of this home is about an eight and a half foot ceiling. It probably makes it down to about seven foot by the back. That probably indicates that they ran out of materials <laughs> as they were building this home. Most of these homeowners could only buy windows when they were affordable. So you can kind of see here, these windows are not even, um, you know, uh, they are not the same size. Uh, they're, they're not even uh, on the same sort of level. So these homes were built by working class people for a, a, a working class neighborhood. Another feature of the Mexican streetscape, and I'm going to come back to this point, that's why I'm just taking a little time to talk about it, is the use of sheet metal, usually on the roof, 
uh, wrought iron as an ornament and the driveways sort of also play a, a role in this. Most of the time, Mexican streetscape homes are very colorful. They're very decorated. Um, as you can see in this one, it's pink. Um, and it's also displaying some very sort of vernacular pedestrian sort of Southwest uh, architectural styles. Like this one is kind of suggesting maybe a mission revival um, with this sort of mixed linear parapet up here. So again, you can see that the windows are not symmetrical in any way. This one's smaller, this one is bigger, but you can see the wrought iron and the small gate. This family has come in and kind of built up the, the features on this. So when Bellamas starts building in Las Cruces in 1952, these are the two neighborhoods. You either lived in Mesquite or you lived in Alameda, and a lot of people lived uh, in Mesquite. Now, when Bellamas starts building, he, he starts originally building his homes in, in Albuquerque. He really only has two architectural styles. And to call them architectural styles might be a stretch. He really only has two sort of home designs. One he calls the Colo Rock, the Colorado Rock, and the other the Pueblo style. And we'll look at both of those in just a second. But from my own work at looking at May and looking at Bellama's work, he really borrows heavily from the, Cal the, the, the California designer Clifford May or Cliff May and his homes uh, in first in San Diego, then later in, in Los Angeles. Cliff May was at first was not a home builder. He was more of a home designer. Uh, and in the late 40s and early 50s, he comes out, out with an affordable home for people that are transplanting to California from the military. He comes up with this very affordable home architectural style called the, the Cliff Main Magic Money House. So I'll point out a couple of things on this. If you look at the bottom of the, well, this isn't gonna work, so I'll just kind of describe it. Each one of these has a plan number, but they always tell you the square footage. So this one's 955 square feet. So it's not a very big home. And usually the price point on the Cliff Main Magic Money Houses are anywhere from uh, about $4,000 to $10,000. So, um, which doesn't seem like, it's like people's mortgages today. So it's kind of, kind of fascinating when we see that. And so this is what a Cliff Main Magic Money House looks like when it's built. So Cliff didn't, he didn't build them. He just put together the plans and then he worked with local lumber companies and he put together all the materials you would need to make your house. And so you could have the house shipped to you or you could hire a local contractor to build the house for you. And so this is actually not in California. This is in the Hardy Park neighborhood uh, in Denver. And so, but you can kind of see this, so the orientation of this would be very much um, more of a California experience. He uses these big windows, these picturesque windows uh, in the front. Um, this is another one of the Cliff Main Magic Money Houses uh, in, in Denver. This is, this is the promotional house that he built in uh, one of the neighborhoods in Los Angeles, this is Long Beach. So you can see the garage to the side. It's not yeah, part of the house in the early footage, and then you can see the, the, the house over here. And this is the back of the house. And so I'm showing you these photos now so that we can really kind of understand how Belma fits into this. So as you can see, these big picturesque windows. And um, what, what Cliff May is really illuminating is something called a seamless transition from indoor to outdoors, or a seamless transition from uh, indoor to outdoors. And so that you, in California, the weather is great all year round. And so you would be able to kind of, the, the space wouldn't seem as confining to him. So when Bellama built his first sort of Colorado rock homes or his Pueblo homes, they look like this. Uh, and most of us are very familiar with these. These are the cinder block homes that are in the original Bellama edition, which is right behind or right adjacent to uh, Lynn Middle School, uh, which we will see in just a moment. So um, he is definitely inspired by what's going on in California. And so he introduces what I would call a stripped down version of those Cliff May magic money houses. And you can kind of see that it is stripped down because he's still trying to give you those picturesque windows. They're just not as sexy as those. <laughs> so, um, and then what becomes part of the Cliff May money, magic money house too, you can see in this promotional material, 
is that he introduces the carport. And if there's anything that's a really important characteristic of the Del Bellamo homes, it will be the carport. Although in this particular house, the carport has been torn down uh, over time. Okay, so when Bellamo starts building the original Bellamo edition in 1952, um, he he first uh, rolls out about 30 homes, and then within a month, he makes a, a commitment to the city of Las Cruces to build nearly 300 homes. And the, real, the original Bellama edition is really between Idaho uh, and Solano. And we'll take a look at them. We'll take a look at some aerial photographs, and this will this will be illuminated in a second. But this is the promotional material. This is the broadside material that customers would have gotten in 1952. I like to call this kind of like the Del Bellama value menu, uh, value menu, like you would get at McDonald's. He only has three homes that you can pick from. You can get a three bedroom home, you can get a, or you can get a two bedroom home, a three bedroom home, or a four bedroom home. And the price points on here are from about $4,000 to $9,000. So he emulates those things that he sees coming out uh, of California. Um, the, uh, when, when I've given this talk before, a lot of a lot of people want to know why he used cinder block. And so I don't have an answer to that. Uh, all I can do is give you an educated answer of why he at first used cinder block. And it's because there's not a lot of building material supply companies in Las Cruces in the early 1950s. But there's a huge cement cinder block company in El Paso. And he advertises that company. So my educated guess is that he forms a relationship with that company because there's a lack of building materials. As Las Cruces starts to get more of that infrastructure um, development company in, in the cityscape, he shifts away from these center blocks and starts using more of the traditional kind of building materials that we see in homes today. Um, at the end of the first of, of Bellum edition, about 1954, he introduces uh, a few more architectural styles, which he calls the Monterey, um, the, the, the Capri, and others, and we can kind of see those um, right here. So these are homes that come off of the first promotional material and the second uh, that I just showed you. And so um, I'm just going to flip through these slides. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these particular homes. So a lot of these homes, are, they don't have the carport. This is one of the larger homes here that Bella designs. You can kind of see the carport back over here. The carport used to be here too. <laughs> And then this is the Pueblo, the other architectural style. This is off of Bellama uh, Drive. And so this is supposed to emulate the Santa Fe style in Albuquerque and um, Santa Fe. I obviously took this one during Halloween, as you can see some of the Halloween uh, direction, uh, decorations. Okay, so this is what I was really building up to. So in 1950, he starts working on this in 1951. Uh, he introduces it in 1952, and it formally gets approved in 1953. This is the original Del Bellama edition of the 278 homes that he introduces. So one thing I want to point out about this, because this is the heart of like really understanding this neighborhood design uh, and the success of Bellama, is that he his, his neighborhood plat, this is the second sheet. I didn't include the first one because it's really grainy and hard to read no matter what you do with it. It's just the way it was kind of scanned and by the, the clerk's office. But you can see that his streets are curvilinear. And so in the promotional material, he brags that his neighborhoods are ideal places for kids to play uh, because the curvilinear streets will slow cars down and kids can take advantage of playing in the streets. I could not imagine that being part of promotional material today. I don't think that neighborhood would survive. But it's fascinating that he uses this. Now, so um, this is the, the annex. So the annex goes from uh, Idaho to Missouri. So really what's kind of dividing these two neighborhoods are is Idaho. Uh, to, well, it's the same neighborhood, just different building phases of it. And then the third part of this is the manor, which is kind of the upper part uh, by Walnut. And it kind of spills over a little bit across the street uh, as well. So this is the original Del Bellman neighborhood. Um, 
built in sort of three phases. So here's the fascinating part. When he, after, after Princess Jenny Park in, in Albuquerque, which opens in 1954, uh, he comes back to Albuquerque and builds the same kind of neighborhood that he built on Las Cruces in Bell Haven um, in 1959. And as you can see, it's almost the same exact neighborhood template. One thing I didn't point out on here is that, and, and I'll go ahead and say this now, even though it's a little bit on a later slide, he tends to use the same street names in a lot of his um, cities. And so in Bell Haven, this is Prince's Jenny Lane. And if you go to the original, oops, I'm technically challenged here. If you go back to the original Del, uh, Del, Del Bellama edition, um, here's Princess Jenny Avenue. He names the street after his wife. He names Princess Jenny Park after his wife. Like I would have, it would have, I think it would have sucked to go to a dinner party with that guy because uh, he would have made you feel like you were not doing enough for your wife, you know? <laughs> You know, hey, my husband bought me a car. Oh, guess what? My husband named a whole community after me. So like, probably not gonna win on that one. You know? So uh, super fascinating in that case. And so this goes into the larger argument that I brought up at the beginning of this talk. Uh, this becomes a shared living experience between people that live in a Del Bellama community in Las Cruces and those that live in a Del Bell community in Santa Fe and later in Albuquerque and Roswell. Alamogordo Hobbs because they all get this similar neighborhood uh, template and I didn't bring them all out those templates are not these templates are not the sexiest thing to look at but I I think that you can kind of understand uh, my point here all right so I think I need to move something here um, at least on my side so let me see if I can do that without messing anything up Here we go. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I got this, I got these next four photographs from the, the Joe Flanagan collection uh, at the Rio Grande Store Collections at MSU. So at the bottom of the screen right here is the Del Bellama edition Annex and Manor. Here's, here's MSU, if, you're, if you've been in, in Las Cruces for a long time. You might remember that circle that kind of went around where Zool Library is today and around where um, KRWG, the, the radio station is, you know, that's, that's long gone. That was gone in the early 90s, late 80s. But you can kind of see that as a marker of NMSU. So you can kind of see this here. So this neighborhood looks completely different than the Mexican streetscape in Mesquite. It looks completely different than those affluent homes in Alameda. Um, so this is what we would see as more of a modern sort of uh, subdivision here. All right, so this is a, the back side of this view. And um, anybody in the audience want to guess what this school is? Conley, yeah, uh, great guess, yeah. So. Um, when I first started working on this project, I would walk the neighborhood because I, you know, that was part of my training from Chris Wilson is that if you walk the neighborhood then you become familiar with it and you can kind of understand it. And so I did the mistake of walking the neighborhood in a, in a shirt and tie and everybody thought I was part of codes. And so they would come out and like, you know, wonder what I was doing. Like, <laughs> so then I didn't dress that way and I dressed like I am now. And they thought I was like, you know, potentially scouting out their home to break in. So I, I couldn't win. But one gentleman that I did interview, he kept saying, yeah, I remember as a kid, I would go out behind Conley Elementary School and shoot rabbits. And I was like, no, there's just no way. Because my whole life, that's been developed. Um, but sure enough, this particular photograph that I found, you can see that that Pizza Hut's not there or there, there's absolutely nothing. The highway uh, is uh, not even there. So these are some great aerial photographs. Anybody want to take a guess where this is? This is on the very back end of the manor. So this is Lynn Junior High. You can see that Young Park is not even developed at this time. So it's super, you know, you can kind of see 
um, the, the, the development uh, in its very uh, early stages. And so you can see that this kind of really cuts up the, um, the, the Las Cruces cityscape. And if you're not familiar with what this triangle is, this is the old airstrip. It's kind of by where Mearshite is, by the boxing club off of um, um, Solano. Solano, yeah, so um, that is actually long gone uh, as well. What's also really fascinating about Bellama is that unlike these other developers that I've looked at over the course of the, the late 50s through the 1980s is that Bellama was really, he's very observant that women played an instrumental role in the decision-making process of buying homes. So he started including women in the development of both the neighborhoods and the home design plans. So, but I should pause. None of the homes that we see that look that we're going to look at through this gendered lens look feminine. They still look very masculine. But Bellama, through the advice of his wife, starts to take into consideration sort of women's sensibilities of space design within a home and the way they look and the way the neighborhood looks. So starting in the Princess Jenny Park in like 1954, 1955, Belma introduces something known as the wife plan community. So again, he, he's scoring more points, you know, with his wife. So it's just super smart, you know, but so as you can see, this becomes Jenny's, uh, Prince, uh, or sort of Jenny, Jen, Janine's, um, ha, uh, Belma, uh, Belma's um, design community. And she rolls out these homes which, you know, they're maybe a little bit softer, not as maybe hard, I guess, in the features. And you can see the names. I don't know if you can see them, but I'll read them off to you. They are the queen, the duchess, and the princess. And she later follows this up with the baroness and the lady. And so, um, and if you read the promotional material both here and in newspapers, they really focus on kitchen space, which I can see some of my advisors, you know, sort of cringing over that. Focus on bathroom space uh, and overall better quality of materials within the home itself, not just generic sort of faucets and, and appliances, but top of the line appliances. So it also suggests that now Bellama has introduced these sort of introductory models into Las Cruces, and now he is focused on introducing more of a middle line or, a, or more of a, a price point that would reflect more of a middle class in Las Cruces at this point. So this is just another part of his wife plan community. How this plays out in Las Cruces is we don't actually get a direct wife line community, but what the wife line community is going to, um, is going to influence will be the next neighborhood that Bellama built in Las Cruces, and that will be Loma Heights. And I'll talk about that in one second. But I do want to mention one other thing that is instrumental in understanding, aside from gender, is the environment. Environmental sensibilities also shape Bellama's homes. Not environmental efficiency like we would think of today, like better window panes and solar technology, but he rolls out something uh, he tests something in Las Cruces that later become part of his homes in, in the other parts of the state, and that's something known as the Solar Queen. So what this is, is, um, so one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, that's, that is, I don't even know if it's important, but I'll just go ahead and say it now, is that uh, for the first 10 years of my life, from 1974 to 1984, I lived at the corner, uh, I lived at 1900 Smith Street, which is at the corner of Smith and Leeds. So I, I, I lived in the Belma neighborhood for the first 10 years of my life, the original audition. And so I, I can relate to this shared experience, but at the end of this phenomenon of, of the Belma neighborhoods, and my house, the house I lived in was one of these solar queens. I didn't know it at the time, you know, I was more into Star Wars and other things that were important, not, you know, the house that I was living in. So, but the Solar Queen is really fascinating. What Bellama starts doing is that he real, he, he also starts to incorporate that seamless transition from indoor to outdoor, but he does it in the backyard. So he starts creating these patios 
in the backyard with these big windows and big sliding doors where you could seamlessly roll out of your uh, dining room right onto the patio and that could be an outdoor patio. And he incorporates, you can't really see it all that well, but at the very top of this, he creates these sort of solar um, or um, sunlight uh, panels in the, in the roof so you could enjoy it, you could warm you up. Uh, in, the, in the winter if you're on the back. And so the house that I lived in had one of these open patios. And man, my, my, my grandparents used it exactly the way the promotional material um, sort of advised. You know, we often were always out there on that patio just hanging out. My grandparents drinking coffee, the kids kind of running amok. So it was super um, fascinating. Where does he get this idea? He gets it from Cliff May. So this is a Cliff May house on the back end. What's missing from the Cliff May house here is that when Cliff May built this, he created these big sort of canopies above it that have these like um, um, uh, cranes that were patented by his company and you could just kind of roll out and then all of a sudden you'd have this canopy above your patio and you could just walk walk out, as you can see here, May is a little bit more intricate. This is the bedroom, this is the living room. So you could just come out onto this open patio at any time. And most of the Mays, you don't see this, but they have an open fire pit over here where you could like have a barbecue or warm yourself in the winter if that, if that needed be. So, so Bellamo rolls out a New Mexico version of that, a cheaper version, not you know as uh, intricate uh, as this one. So the last part that I'm going to talk about today, and I don't know how I'm doing on time, it looks like I'm, I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to wrap this up pretty, pretty quickly here. So the next neighborhood that he built, in 1959, the city wants him to build another neighborhood, so he's commissioned to build Loma Heights. And this neighborhood is going to reflect a lot of what he's doing in Princess Jenny Park uh, in Albuquerque. So it's going to be more of an upscale whole, uh, community. He's really targeting those civilians that are working at White Sands Missile Range at the time. Uh, the price point is a lot more at this point. And by 1960, these homes go anywhere from about 14 to 22,000. And one of the tricky things about understanding this, this neighborhood is that Bellama says that there's three additions, but the city says there's only two. So there's the original Loma Heights. There is Loma Heights South, which both the city and Bellama concur. And then Bellama, later on and even after he dies and the company is still making homes they refer to yucca heights but I, I could not find that in the city that took me down so many rabbit holes i literally spent so many hours of my life trying to find this place uh, i know where it exists according to Bellamo, but the city doesn't acknowledge it so there might be a little bit of flexibility but he rolls out um what becomes really important about these homes is that he makes the enclosed garage he, could, he kind of slightly moves away from those carports, and now the car becomes a, an important part of these homes and features of this. And so, although this is uh, Loma Heights, although I just said that, he's also still introduced those carports too. <laughs> Some of them have been enclosed, like you can see this. If you drive through Belmont today, most of the homes do not reflect anything like they were originally built. So be the second to last thing I say. So you can always tell when you're in a Del Bellama community, if you look down at the sidewalk. Not all of these exist anymore because the sidewalks have been rebuilt in a lot of the communities, but he played on his name and he had this stamped in the sidewalk of every home, in front of the sidewalk of every home. It's harder to find these in the original Bellama edition, the annex and the manor. It's a little easier to find them over in Loma Heights. Um, so, uh, I want to say a couple of other things. Um, by the time that Del Bellama dies in 1972, uh, his company is worth about $50 million. He builds approximately, at least from the records that I have, he builds approximately 2,300 homes in Las Cruces and more than 50, or about 15,000 uh, in the state of New Mexico. Pretty impressive, if you ask me, for a community this small. So he puts his he puts a big sort of footprint or thumbprint on the built uh, the built community. 
right before, in starting in 1960, he actually moves out of building homes, except for in Las Cruces, Santa Fe, and Albuquerque. He moves into building, partnering with um, Hilton and starts building um, hotels, he starts building malls. If you're from Albuquerque, he builds Coronado Mall. He also builds um, Windrock. He also starts building trailer parks. And his company, after he dies, builds two trailer parks in Las Cruces, in Cantata Trailer Park, which is right by Mearshite, by that, by that airstrip, and Winter Haven off of Burke Road. And if you drive into Winter Haven, uh, it has the curvilinear streets as well. And that was built in the early 1980s. Um, Bellama dies unexpectedly in 1972, he has a heart attack. Um, when he dies, uh, his family holds on to the company until about 1978, and then they sell it to the Han Company based out of uh, California. That company sells it in the early 1980s to Tamco. Then in the late, mid to late 1980s, Albu uh, uh, Bellama's former employees raise enough money and they buy the company back at this point. Um, from Tamco, and then they partner with this company called Public, Public Service Company of New Mexico. But by that time, so many things had changed in the home building community that Bellama, uh, the, Bell the former Bellama company, could no longer was no longer sustainable. And so, in 1989, the company files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and then in 1990, formally files for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And so, the company. Um, so it does no longer exist after 1990. What I, what I hope, what the points that I would really like us to kind of take away from this talk today is, um, because I'm a historic preservationist, I'd like to make a, an argument that we should actually nominate the original Bellama edition to the National Register of Historic Places. Las Cruces, because it becomes a template for other neighborhood communities throughout the state um, plays a, a huge role in really shaping this, this similar live experience that New Mexicans had all over New Mexico. So I think it's worthy of that particular, um, of that particular, um, that, that nomination. I'd also like to say that um, Bellamo, because he's able to prove that Las Cruces, even though in its sort of being very small, a very small cityscape was able to, um, uh, because mass-produced homes and these sort of these subdivisions, these these sort of mass-produced subdivisions was was workable. Here we can kind of see that that shows that that he 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 the original Bellama edition influences the way we think about subdivisions today. These mass-produced homes around these similar subdivision flats. So we owe that to Bellama because he introduces it in Las Cruces shows that it works and it continues to influence the way that we live uh, in Las Cruces. Loma Heights, this community that I just showed you here, one of the sub arguments I make is that, you know, although it was built for a, more of an, uh, an upper middle class clientele in the 60s and the 70s, Las Cruces have, over, have taken over that community and it looks a lot like the Mesquite Bay Mexican streetscapes. Let me show you. If you look at this home, oops, I keep doing that. If you look at this home right here, it, it, it has sort of the bright pink colors that we saw in the Mesquite neighborhood. It has this short little sort of public right away. Um, this home doesn't have it, but some of the other homes in Loma Heights have like the, the wrought iron uh, ornamentation. And so, you know, not making a hard argument about that, but I would just say that that neighborhood has really changed and it kind of reflects one of our, our, our older neighborhoods in the city. Last but not least, I would just say um, that even though I made some very traditional scholarly arguments in this paper, I'd like to end on this note. Um, even though I was able to sort of, you know, suggest a lot of things, um, what makes Bellama's homes and neighborhoods so successful in New Mexico is because ideas from nearby shape, um, shape people. Um, 
And what I mean by that is that um, I just recently moved down the street right over here in Telshore. I painted my house when I first moved in. I, I moved into a house that was the original owner and he never painted it after 1978. So it's, it's desperately in need of a painting. So I painted it and then all of a sudden my other three neighbors painted their houses. It had nothing to do with the community. It had nothing to do with anything else. Maybe I guilted them or shamed them. I don't know, you know. But I, I felt like the fact that I painted my house kind of influenced the fact that they were going to paint their homes. And it was really mostly about this idea of just being nearby and it kind of shaped that. So oftentimes when people lived in these Bellama communities, they weren't thinking of these larger things that I showed you in this presentation today. Probably their family members lived in the Bellama neighborhood. And this was a way for them to get uh, access into a home, maybe for the first time. And so what really shaped and made his, his neighborhoods very successful is this idea of, of, of local ideas or nearby ideas shaping people's experiences. And so um, when we think about Bellama and we think about those neighborhoods, um, what also makes him super or, or also very successful uh, is that he created a shared living experience for not only people in Las Cruces, but for people all over New Mexico, Southern Colorado, and West Texas. So I appreciate you coming out tonight and supporting local history and local scholars. Uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Jerry, we don't have any questions uh, here in the virtual meeting yet, but one person did make a statement. Uh, Dan S. said that when his dad bought their Del Delma house on El Caminito in the mid 60s, there was a waiting list for the homes. And he got moved up on the waiting list because he was a veteran of World War II. Oh, that's awesome to know. Very, very cool. I did have a question actually. Uh, I noticed, like with neighborhoods today, part of if you're a de developer, sometimes you have to include a park in your development. Were there any parks that the uh, Bellum Bellum made? Yeah, so that's a really great question, and it's one that I chose not to address in uh, the talk. So, well, Bellum promised people starting in 1954 when he started building Princess Jenny Park, and then he started building. Um, neighborhoods in Las Cruces and the rest of the uh, rest of New Mexico is that he promised to have a school in each one of his neighborhoods. So you saw that with Lynn Middle School and with Conley, and he promised to provide a access to uh, amenities like a grocery store uh, and a laundromat and a swimming pool. And so if you look at Solano Square where Baskin Robbins is today, there's a little grocery store in there and there's lots of little businesses in there, that was a way of accommodating his promise to people to buy his, his homes, that they would have access to those kinds of amenities uh, within the neighborhood. Um, he never gets really around to building pools in Las Cruces, but he does it um, in, in Albuquerque and in bigger places, and maybe there's a little bit more pressure on him. So he doesn't really think of parks as much as he thinks about things that um, people would want if they were to if they were to move into a neighborhood. Again, we don't think about that today because if you get on Zillow right now and you look for homes, one of the first thing it tells you is like all the schools that are near the neighborhood, right? And all the shopping places that are near the neighborhood. But that wasn't always accessible in the 1950s. So Bellama kind of brought that to his neighborhoods. And if you if you if you look at the I can't think of the street name right. Oh, you know one thing I meant I forgot to mention about women is that he names a whole bunch of street names after women in Loma Heights. Connie Lou, Deborah, Anita. So if you drive in there, I, I couldn't figure out why he did that. So, so it's, what's that? Uh, Martha. Martha too, absolutely, yeah. So there, there's, all, there's like nine of them. So, and I tried to track that down and I couldn't either. So nonetheless, I digress, but excellent question. Got a question here. Uh, you are aware that the city of Las Cruces is about to change Bellama Drive. No, I wasn't. No. The city of Las Cruces has told the citizens of Bellama Drive that they are going to lose five feet off the front of their property 
on both sides of the street. And uh, this just came up last year. They've had two public meetings, and at the same time, um, they're going to, they claim that based on the flattened show, Belmont told the city that the street could be 50 feet wide. Oh, so, so, so the issue is like access to cars, right? Well, the city is claiming through its public works department that the only the reason they're doing this massive reconstruction of Belmont is to fix the infrastructure of the sewer water line. Yeah, that makes and sense. And put in dedicated bike lanes so they can take tap money from the state. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when they did their first drive through, they used a 50 foot fire truck to prove on a trash day that you shouldn't have any parking on those. So they're dedicated over close to $800,000 in this renovation, but they've only told there are 70 homes, uh, including at the end of that, um, on those streets. And so uh, a lot of people don't realize this is going on. And I, I, I do have a historical site, I mean, a historical uh, organization. Yeah, I heard about that. Everything over, these are all over 50 years old. So the city of Las Cruces is trying to figure out a way in which they can destroy people's homes <laughs> in this historical neighborhood for, for the purpose of fixing what they would be in anywhere else in the city. Yeah. So I was unaware of that. Uh, so the question or the, the comment was more of like the fact that they're widening Bellama Drive, right? Bellama Drive, not Bellama uh, Circle. Yeah, Bellama Drive. Bellama Drive. But at the same time, because of Del Bellama's subdivision, yeah. all the other streets are the same size. Right. But according to what they showed in this public meeting, uh, supposedly written in some portion of the flat. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm unaware of that. The only thing, the thing, the thing I could comment for sure on what you said was that I I know that in some of the the sewage, some of the piping in Belma, he used some less than better quality materials, like kind of almost like paper construction of some of those pipes, and it's it's a lot better than that but that's the analogy and i know that people in the last like 10 or 15 years have had a lot of sewers issues with trees going through the pipes and a lot of that having to be replaced because he chose a, a cheaper uh, material than what we would see today so i don't know if that's in every home it doesn't I'm, I'm sure if it was there would be more widespread conversation about it but i know that some residents have voiced that to me uh, and having and, and replacing it. And if you would have used better materials, it would still be workable today. So, but very fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I um, I haven't looked at Delma in about three years because I'm looking at other projects now. But that's that's good to know. And so, I did. Okay. I live on Leeds in Mexico. Okay. So I have to tell you that the. The city's not being very transparent about this um, situation. And of course, it has been mentioned to now the historical organization of the city of Las Cruces. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, the city still wants to take away. Yeah, no, it's great. And, I, and I'm definitely going to have to look into it. I don't, I mean, it's, I appreciate you bringing it out. I was unaware of it. You know, I drive through the neighborhood often. You know, um, I drove through it this morning. I look at my grandparents' house very often. Uh, I love Young Park, so I, I, I'm obviously not a resident, but I feel a connection to it, so I go through it often. Well, so I was unaware of that, though. As a, sec well, I, I'll get it as a secondary question, what did Dale Bellman think of them putting in Young Park? Well, it, he, so here's the interesting thing about Bellama, and then one thing I didn't share that the beginning is that all of his company records are no longer around. So I had to create an archive in order to retell this story. And what I mean by that is the only thing that's left of the original company are the promotional materials that I shared with you. And there's three folders of those at, at the, South, the Center for Southwest Research at UNM. And that's it. Um, my assumption is that when 
his company was bought out and then it was bought out and it was bought out. Those company records got gobbled up and then they eventually got destroyed or maybe they're sitting in a warehouse somewhere. But I don't have any direct things of Velma. So the way I was able to capture his voice and retell it is that he loved getting giving interviews. Um, he loved to brag about his success. <laughs> he loved it. And so he, he would take any interview he could. So I never came across anything with Young Park. So I don't know what his official position uh, on that is. Um, it's a good question. And the, the park is kind of an enigma because it comes a little bit later after the, the subdivision. So. It's a good question. Subdivision. So it's a good question and it's one I don't have an answer to. Yeah, I appreciate it though. Yeah. You might have a question back there. Was, was the construction all cedar block or was it construction of the homes. Mm -hmm. Is it senior block? So the yeah, so it's a good question. So the first the so here's the thing too. You have to remember that neighborhoods are organic. It's not like they built all the homes and they went on to the next one. They built and there was empty blocks and then they built and there were empty lots. So for the first two years, the only viable cheap construction material was cinder block. But then Las Cruces because it's expanding rapidly, realizes there are businessmen that realize that other building materials are more desirable in Las Cruces. So then lumber companies, more, uh, more lumber companies start to pop up, you know, drywall, uh, uh, stucco becomes more available. So he, he shifts. So not all the homes are set, but a lot of them are set block, but a lot of them are. Um, especially in the original uh, edition. Now, you might go into the original edition and see a non center block home, and chances are it might have been built later uh, as, in, as an infill solution. So um, I didn't track down every home because there's a ton of them, but that's the pattern, and it definitely, um, that is the pattern uh, of the original edition. Yeah. Did you have a, another one? So, so they, so they Homes really were not what we would call prefab. They were actually custom built homes. They were, yeah, so that's a good question. And I would say they are because he has the same crew building the same home and they just dump off all the materials and they're just building the same home. But they're not like panel construction where they're building the panels and just kind of slapping them up. But yeah, they, they are. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's mass produced is what it would be, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So one thing, Jim, I'll get to you one second. One thing I like to, to to share is that as you're out in the neighborhood and you're you're talking to people, this was a, a common thing expressed to me, which is one I can remember living in one of these homes. They weren't insulated, or they weren't insulated very well. And so in the summer, you have your evaporated air going, and there would be like slimy moss on the wall. And in the winter, the condensation would freeze. So you'd have a frozen wall. Uh, so that's a that's a very interesting shared experience for people that grew in the grew up in those older non-insulated walls. Now you can see if you drive through the neighborhood, a lot of those homes have covered up the center block so that they can insulate them so that they're not, you know, now that they're a little bit more energy efficient. So that, when you brought up the cinder block, I wanted to share that because that's a lot of people told me those stories. And you know, I remember that too, as a kid. One thing you might want to consider in that cinder block thing is the white sands, all the weary housing, all the early housing, all cinder block. Mm -hmm. So there was competition for material and they were putting up a couple hundred houses out there at the same time. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Same thing with uh, the student housing at, uh, at NMSU as well. It's the same kind of construction. Yep. Dr. Walls? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm talking from back in the back of the room here. I know we have another question in the back, uh, but we do have several comments and questions that have come in via Zoom. Okay. And so I would like to, to run those by me cool. as well. And can I ask you a favor? Could you move a little bit over so you're in front of there you go so people can see you? Yeah, I can't see out there, so I was trying to make eye contact. Yeah, okay. It, so one, one of the comments, and again, is from Dan S., and he says that next to Young Park was the National Guard Armory. Yep, that's right. Where Old Navy is, and it was a grocery store called Fed Mart, and you had to be a government employee to shop there at the Fed Mart. 
I remember FedMart, yeah, and Montgomery Wards, you know, right and, up from that. Gail asks the question, uh, what section of the neighborhood is Skyway Drive in? We have the Dale Belton stamp on the sidewalk and the house is not cinder block, but brick on front of sides. So if I remember correctly, and um, I'll put my name, my email in the chat, and I'll just double check my records on this. Um, I'm pretty sure that that is in the manor the Bellama Manor. Um, so that would be later construction. That would be like 1956 or so. Um, that's my best recollection on that off the top of my head, but I can just go home and check, uh, you know, the files and be 100%, but that would be my educated guess off the top of my head. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I apologize to the Zoom folks that I did not mute myself when I was asking those questions. Uh, moving on, uh, Faith uh, has a comment. She says, Dr. Wallace, the Las Cruces, the Las Cruces the Preservation Commission, Preservation Development Area Survey, and established it as a historic token. Awesome. Um, I was unaware of that as well. I was going to, I'm teaching historic preservation a year from now. And that was going to be, I think that was going to be one of our projects was to survey that neighborhood so that we could start working on that. But that's great to hear. So it's definitely, it's badly needed. So that's great to hear. Great. Another comment from Dan S. He says that you mentioned something about the sewer pipes. He said that uh, he used a orange bird pipe for the sewers. Okay. Great to know. <laughs> <laughs> you told him, no, that's great. I mean, this is usually the conversations I have with Bellama residents, you know, so uh, I learn way more than they learn from me. So <laughs> and then one more question here on Zoom, and then we can get to the, the young man. Okay. Uh, Dan asks, did he have anything to do with the married student housing on the NMSU campus, which of course is also separate? Yeah, so no. And um, if you're familiar with the historian Chris Schertz um, in town, um, who has written these great, beautiful pieces about Las Cruces history, he used to write in the My Las Cruces section of the Sun News. A lot of people know Chris. I'm sure he's probably talked here a couple of times. Um, uh, he, so I was, for my work, I was pretty convinced that Bellama did not do those. And so when uh, Chris and I were, were talking this over, he was convinced that Bellama did. And so I just left it there. And then the next day, Chris sent me an email and goes, hey, I looked all that up and Bellama definitely did not do them. And he knew the actual developer and designer that did those. And I don't remember them off that, the top of my head, but um, if you know anything about Chris, you know that he's very dedicated <laughs> tracking down stuff. And so, I consider that to be golden information. So according to Richard, those are not Belma um, homes. And I and it's not in any of the records, and it's not as part, that's not part of the county where we could get a hold of it as far as uh, as far as I was able to. So so that's so no, that would be the answer to that one. This is a good question. Uh, so did something change in the how you talk about how Velma eventually goes bankrupt. They come to Floyd's buyback, it goes bankrupt. Is there something that changed in the way people buy homes that that model became um, unprofitable moving forward? So it's, it's a great question. And so, um, so there's an art, there's a design shift both in neighborhood design and architectural design starting in 1980. Um, Bellama builds in what we would consider the California ranch home style or the ranch home and the ranch plan. By 1980, you move away from that particular plan and you start seeing open plans. Uh, you start seeing more homes that are uh, uh, kind of more of like um, the homes that we would see like in Las Colinas or like pretty much anywhere in Las Cruces, you know, outside of these more older kind of neighborhoods, these more mass produced homes that you know, uh, don't have a lot of architectural sort of design or, or feature. And so there's just a, a different concept of home ownership starting in the 1980s. There's also a slowdown in the market in Las Cruces. Um, Bellama builds in this peak time by 1980, the, 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 the population kind of plateaus a little bit before kind of creeping back up in the early 2000s. 
So he he doesn't wait around for that opportunity. He's dead, and his the company doesn't wait around for it. And so um, that's that's one of the reasons we we don't see it. Uh, and um, families become a little bit bigger, so having bigger style homes becomes important. If you've ever been in a Bellum home, they're they're typically a lot smaller. Not all of them. What I've kind of noticed is I've been as I've driven through the neighborhood in the last year. The home that I lived in at the corner of 1900 Smith Street had a carport. It's no longer. It's, it looks like it's a bedroom now or an extension of the living room, which was right next to it. The Solar Queen patio on the back is now filled in. And so that family has grown and they've accommodated that by expanding the home, adding on to it and building on to it. So, but if you look at the original floor plan, I, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's more than like uh, 1,100 square feet, which is probably pretty small for a family of four or five or, or six. And so um, the, the Bellama homes have, it's really fascinating to drive through the neighborhood and see like some of the changes to them. And I would encourage all of you to do it because they, they've taken on like their own organic lifestyle. And it's fascinating to see what some residents have done uh, with, with those homes. So that would, that would be the, the short answer to that. There's other sort of, you know, things to consider as well. That's a great question. I have to ask one. Since most of the homes in the Bell area were between 995 square feet to 1,200 square feet, why do you offer such a large lot size? That's a good question too. So again, we're thinking, so I don't have a perfect that answer to that. What's that? Can you repeat that question? So the question is, is uh, since Bellama typically introduced, he, he had homes as big as 1,500 square feet and, and, and he would customize them for families that would want them. He had a 500, a five bedroom. Um, I think it was at like 1,600 square feet and you don't see too many of those in, in the community. But the question is, if Bellama typically built between about 1,000 to, to about 1,200 square feet homes, why are those um, homes on a big lot size? And so that was just what was accepted at the time. Um, this goes back to one of the earlier seeds that I laid in this, this argument was that home ownership became this way of Americans expressing their patriotism. So um, being able to, you know, um, uh, bond with your neighbors and your family and your friends and people could come over, people use their yards, their backyards differently than they use them now. Um, I have a, I, a, my house is on a big lot right now and I wish it was like half the size. Uh, I'm just so thankful there's no lawn because I just would die, you know? But that wasn't the, the same sort of mindset. So I think it's, it was to accommodate the growing family, to give kids a place to play. Um, uh, and that was just the way that a lot of homes were thought about, the planning of those homes were thought about at the time. You can see that, you can even see that if you drive around this neighborhood, uh, if you drive around like Majestic Ridge, Imperial Ridge, but then if you cross over um, like Candlelight into the new division that was built like 20 years ago, those lots are so much smaller and those neighborhoods butt up against each other. They were built at different times. The older one have these massive lots, the, the, small, the other ones have smaller. Developers got smart too. They realized that they could put three homes on a, a size of, a, a, of plots that they normally would do for two so they could get more money off of it. So it's also a de developer decision uh, as well. So, but the educated answer for Bellama was more to accommodate a growing family as a, a sales pitch too, get people to buy these neighborhoods. Yeah. What, what was the size of a lot? Size of a lot could be anything. You know, uh, it, it, it's, I, I don't know like half acre or anything like that. He never touts that in the literature, but those lots are, are pretty big. Some of them are pretty big, not all of them, but some of them. So I don't have a, an exact answer for you on that. It's a good question. I think it all depends on what, what addition that you're in. If you're looking at the addition, the annex and the, the manor, uh, the lots get a little bit smaller when you go over to, to Loma Heights, but I don't, I don't know the exact dimensions because they, they, they are different. If you go in and look at some of those homes in the addition, they, they change from phase to phase. So I don't, I don't have a really good answer for you. It's a great question. You said the city of Las Cruces invited 
just to bail them up to develop an area. Mm -hmm. Who owned the land? Was it city owned? Was it privately owned? It's a great question. I might tell you why the lots were so large or so small. But he had to spend a lot of money to yeah. buy the property. He would put a lot of homes on. Yeah. If the land was inexpensive or free from the city, he could do large pieces of home lots. And that's a great point. And I, I don't have that information. I don't know who, how he acquired the land. Um, in, in, in the interviews that I read with Bellama, he just says that in about a five day span in May of 1952, he goes from building um, about 32 homes to building 278 as a commitment to the city. And that's what he, he uses as his mantra when he interviews in the Las Cruces Sun News. Um, I, I do have those particular conversations and footnotes that you can easily access by going in and looking at the Las Cruces Sun News arc archives, but he never mentions who he gets the land from. I don't know if it's a negotiation between him and the city to get here and build homes as fast as he can. I don't know how he gets it. I know he has to buy the land. I don't know what he buys it for. Um, I don't know. I, he's, it, you have to also remember, when he commits to this, he's not even sure that this can work in Las Cruces. He's still on the fence. Like this works in Albuquerque, but I don't know if it can work in a smaller city. So he's reluctant to commit to something very big like he's doing in Albuquerque with the Princess Jenny Park, which is a commitment to build 1600 homes uh, at $15 million. He brags about that money and that development. He almost, you, he seems reluctant to think in some of those interviews that this could really cost him some money if it doesn't work. So quickly though, his mind has changed because he, he starts building more and more and more because people are buying more and more. So yeah, I wish I had some better answers, but those company records are just, you know, they're great questions. I just don't have the answer for them. So anything else? Other questions? Is there anything in the chat, Dennis? Yeah, we do have one more question here from Anonia uh, and a Communities United. Uh, they were asking, is the character of Bellum neighborhoods today similar in different New Mexico communities? How are these neighborhoods perceived today? Oh, that's a great question. That's a super great question. So um, if you watch, the, if you ever watch the TV show Breaking Bad, um, and especially if you watch the very last movie, El Camino, um, that was filmed, <laughs> the, the, the two side characters, um, they live in a Bellama home. And he built in those neighborhoods, those Cinderella, they were called Cinderella homes. They look like Disneyland homes. And a lot of people in Albuquerque have gone to great lengths to try to pres preserve those particular homes because of their identity and that connection to Disneyland um, and that idea of Disneyland. So I would say that in Albuquerque, if you ever, if you go to Albuquerque, you've been to Albuquerque, they're super good about um, creating neighborhood, uh, neighborhood um, groups and then those neighborhood groups working on preserving the homes in those communities. And so I would say in Albuquerque, there's been a better effort to preserve uh, Bellhaven, Princess Jenny Park, and other communities, whereas it sounds like only recently we have a Bellama group here that are trying to protect the, the Bellama uh, homes in this community. And I don't know what that looks like because that's kind of news uh, to me. So um, it's a great question. And I would say that you, you don't see, you see a, in, when I've gone to other places, they seem to take on the characteristic of what we see in the Bellama edition here, where there's been a lot of um, modifications done to make them more efficient or to expand to accommodate a family. So I don't think there's a lot of um, rehabilitation to make them look like the original Bellama homes. They're more of an up updated modern version of how to use them efficiently, especially uh, energy wise. Not always the case, but because um, you saw in some of the slides there were people that protected them, they painted them gray. But if you drive through the original Bellum edition today, you'll see that there's been a lot of, you know, the center block is no longer visible and there, there's been a ways of trying to 
you know, make them more energy efficient? So it's a great question. I, I have not gone to the Alamo Gordo one or uh, the Hobbs or the Roswell one or the one in Lubbock. So, um, and I haven't gone to the one in Colorado Springs either. That was built right after Velma died. So I don't know what those look like in those communities at the moment, other than doing a virtual Zillow sort of tour of some of those. And you can tell they're a Bellama home. But as far as keeping them in the, the condition as they were, it doesn't look like that from that particular um, way of looking at them. Other questions, concerns? I think we're about out of time. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallace. Great presentation. Great day. Thanks. Now, as a new member, you get a copy of the, copy of the review oh, right. from January last year. Oh, cool. It's on all of